with me being young, I had to be, you know, that overconfident, over cocky guy to even have a foot in the door. So definitely finding that green line, that middle line there was uh, was a little hard, but I'm glad I found it now. It's a new week and a new episode of the Skid Steer Nation podcast. As always, I am your host, Ryan Deemer. And today we've got Jonah Gilbo, the founder of Apex Land Clearing and Development. He embarked on his journey at the young age of 16 and has since risen to prominence as a respected leader in land development. His mastery lies in meticulously clearing land and implementing effective erosion control systems. While Apex is renowned for its speed and coordination, Jonah's true triumph lies in recognizing the crucial importance of pacing oneself. Encapsulated in his own powerful mantra, it's a marathon, not a race. Now, give me one second to talk about Skid Steer Nation. We'll get Jonah introduced on the show. Guys, Skid Steer Nation is your trusted source for Skid Steer attachments and expert advice. We cater to seasoned contractors like Jonah and newcomers to the field. We've got some unbeatable deals and a knowledgeable team ready to guide you at every step. Skid Steer Nation ensures you have the right attachments and support to tackle any project, regardless of its scale. Visit skidsteernation.com today and elevate your skid steer to the next level. Jonah, thanks for being on the show, man. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Likewise. Thanks for having me, Ryan. It's absolutely, a- man. It, you, man. It, it, it's kind of cool. Like we jumped on and, um, you know, you were excited to tell us that, you know, we were one of the first Instagram accounts you guys, you started following, you've been listening to the podcast and um, I, yeah. it sounds like you've made yep. it's made a little bit of an impact for you and your business. And that's always amazing for me to hear as as far as the host of this. So thank you. Right, right. Yeah. So basically, when we first started, and I mean, I knew social media was going to be a growing factor into this industry, you know, just at times, you know, as time progresses and all that fun stuff. So I knew I need to find, you know, some way finding how to get started, because my story was I didn't really have anyone to, you know, rely on. I didn't have a grandfather. I didn't have a dad that was in the industry, you know, that can, you know, go, you know, operate machinery on their farm and whatnot. So I really had to rely on my own, you know, findings, research and how to get started on this, especially, you know, not having any prior knowledge other than operating you know, in the industry, it was definitely a, a new challenge to embark on. And I thank you guys just for, you know, the information you provide and the people you bring on. It's just, you know, hopefully the this interview that, I'm, that we're doing right here can uh, hopefully in, inspire the next the next Jonah. T- t- touch somebody else to to move into the next level for themselves. Right, I'm always yeah. curious because I'm such a big proponent of like having the right mindset. I, I don't care how great your skill set is. I don't care how amazing you can do the work. If you don't have the right mindset, like you can self-sabotage yourself quickly. Right. And you having no experience in the industry, were you just too young and naive to actually have a negative mindset or did you have to fight through that imposter syndrome and I'm not good enough mindset to get where you are today? Yeah. So kind of to give you a little bit of a background. So how I started was I was in, so I'm 19 currently. And so when I was in, I believe sixth grade, so this is going on like 2016, so it was eight years ago. So um, I had a game on my computer called, Far- called Farming Simulator. Um, I realized you could get two joysticks and basically operate machinery. Like I said, I didn't have any access to machinery at the time to operate and you know learn. So downloaded that game, got the two joysticks, clocked like, I want to say 450 hours just on that one game, just strictly operating machine or, you know, bounce between excavators, skid steers, dozers, the whole shebang. So the whole nine yards started doing that, getting exposure and, you know, how to do some stuff. Then I had a buddy that reached out to me and said, you needed help. And this, you know, would be my first time operating machinery. So went out to there, helped them. And then I started to realize after that project concluded that I'm, I was 16 when that project happened. And that's when I started the company in 2021. So I realized, you know, I like operating a lot, but no one's going to hire a 16 year old operator. So Started out, ran my own company, you know, started doing that. And I was like, all right, so this is kind of nice. And I realized, you know, the full star truck, even though running a business isn't just operating machinery, you know. So that's just the tip of the iceberg. So the first couple of jobs I had were definitely were definitely a learning curve. So I would say that um, it took a lot of, you know, beating down to learn, you know, it t- I had to learn a lot of my stakes. It was stuff I would have learned from somebody else in the field, which kind of did set me back a little bit. But I do see that as, you know, the biggest blessing. You know, God's been the biggest factor in all of this. You know, without him, there's no there's no apex, there's no me. So without him, without him putting me through those, you know, trials and tribulations, you know, I don't think I would be able to even be where I am right now to, you know, take on, you know, the contracts that we want to, you know, now and just, you know, be able to try to execute some of the 
the progressive goals that we have. So that's one of the biggest things. Um, it definitely it took a toll on me at the start. I didn't know if this was going to be, you know, the right goal. If I was wasting people's time, if I was wasting my time, you know, it took a lot of, you know, self self motivation to keep to keep going. That's crazy. I, you know, as an older adult, I just get excited when I hear somebody at your age saying, yeah, I was 16 and I knew I wouldn't, I wasn't going to get a job as an operator. So I just started my own business. Like, no <laughs> clue what I'm that. doing. I'm just diving in. Like I want to work equipment. The only way I know how to do that is to start my own business. It's crazy how that's just like the first go-to that I thought of too. And it's originally my parents, I, I didn't understand why at the time, but I do now. They were obviously skeptical of me, you know, going to them like, hey, like let's go to the state registry, you know, the state secretary and follow a, uh, an LLC real quick. They were like, all right, hold on, we'll slow your roll. What's this all about? <laughs> and then my older brother at the time, uh, or not at the time, my older brother, uh, during that time period, he was really pushing hard. He was like, this is going to be great for him. You know, Joe, he's, that's his name. He was like, Joe was telling my parents, like, this is going to be a great exposure for him to learn, you know, business management, and all this, you know, all this stuff at a young age. So I was like, well, he said. <laughs> and so with uh, with that, they were like, okay, let's, uh, let's try and embark on this new journey. That's awesome. And like, I can't tell you many guys I talk to that are, substantially older than you and they all have the same story right like i loved equipment i did a few jobs i started a business it kind of started out part-time and then they transitioned to full-time and they kind of hit that ceiling where it's just them maybe one part-timer and they get they're not sure what the next phase is they're afraid and i get it right you're afraid to invest in somebody else and then being responsible for their family and their livelihood it's a you know you've got to make sure you got the work coming in and here you are at 19 years old You've got a whole bunch of part-time employees currently working for you and maybe some subs, but your vision this year is to start building your own full-time crew. Right. So what? essentially with yeah. like the last, I want to say, so 2020 was my sophomore year of high school. So that's where I started. And so all the way up, I'm in my, this would be my first year of college, you know, whatever you want to see, however you want to see it. So three years, this is going to a third year of business. A lot of people, um, it's really hard. Or let me say this, when I first started, it wasn't really a thing to kind of pursue as like a full-time gig because with me still being in high school, you know, at least get your GED, you know, that's the bare minimum. And then, you know, trying to be able to run a business while trying to, you know, go through high school is definitely two things that a young person doesn't really go through too often. So it was definitely, you know, slow your rolls on the first, you know, two years, year and a half that I was in business. But now, you know, I want to say to put this in perspective, we're running, you know, mainly our our niche was backyards all the way up until, you know, started 2023. And then we really started pushing hard for heavy commercial, light commercial and all that stuff, you know, clearing minor mass acreage. And so we've had the opportunity, you know, to be a part of some really, really cool projects, especially last year. And that's what kind of opened our doors up into erosion control because, you know, light clearing, as most people know, is, is a really saturated uh, server or industry wherever you go whether southeast northeast you know however you want to put it there's either forestry mulch and there's people with you know kg rate or kgs rakes you know track house doing all their doing their thing so being able to take the time last year figure out that land clearing is what we're good at is what we want to stick with in addition to erosion control it's just kind of helped broaden our name in our market which is what we really want to do and so i want to say it's yeah, so about midway last year is when we started really getting it solidified into the heavy commercial. I want to say around the mid July is when we really started to see a break there. And then pushing on to now, I mean, it's the only thing we've been on. It's it's kind of crazy to think about because I was talking to my dad about it last night. It's like it was crazy looking at uh, getting a, a Facebook Messenger request for a backyard. And now we're getting emails, you know, to do. 20, 30, 40 acres, you know, some for governmental ag agencies, you know, grading contractors, the list just goes on, you know, like I said, I'm just super blessed to even be in the position I'm in. Yeah. I mean, the, the type of work you're talking about now, I would have to just assume and correct me if I'm wrong, but you're probably not looking at any project that is lower than $25,000. I mean, it really strictly depends because that's when that's what a lot of people assume, but it honestly just depends on what field we're looking at. Because if we get a job that's erosion control, that's $25,000. That's a pretty big erosion control project. But if we get something that's land clearing, that's around $25,000. Again, it could be a pretty good land clearing size project. It just kind of depends how you're going about clearing the land. Because you can clear land, for example, up here near uh, Atlanta. It's around, I will put you out, you know, you could be at $20,000, you know, just say a number per acre to clear, grub, and or haul off or uh, grind. 
So, you know, you factor that, you know, that could be a small project, but if you go out into, you know, somewhere that's more rural, so like say near Wake, Wake Ross, Georgia, which is a little bit, you know, south of here, about three hours south of here, you know, you could be at $7,500 to clear and burn. You know, that's still a pretty good sized land clear project. Yeah. You know, acre, but so. it just the of, scope of things for, you know, and I hate to keep saying anything about your age because you're obviously doing very well as a business owner and age is irrelevant to me in that regard. But like you went from doing five hundred, two thousand dollar backyard jobs, right? And now, when's the last time you bid a job less than seventy five hundred dollars? Oh gosh! Right, and that's that's yeah. the point I'm trying to make, right? Like yeah, the, it's, the it step like, you took and the type of work that you're doing, right? And it's that pretty impressive that really, as quickly as you did it. Exactly, and that's one thing that I really got. I sit back and I think about all the time. It's just like, wow! It's like I can't tell if I'm because I see it all the time, you know. Facebook is one of the best things. Anyone going into the industry, Facebook is going to be your best. It's like an online textbook for everything that happens. You get to meet a bunch of incredible guys, you know, in your area, across the nation that do what you do and that have been doing or that just starting out. And, you know, you get to learn from one another. So that's been the biggest thing that I've kind of been able to, you know, take advantage of is that you got to love to, you obviously got to love what you do, but you got to love learning about what you do. Someone put told me the other day, if there's new information that comes about comes out about any industry. So, you know, for example, a doctor could have a new article come out about their industry and, you know, a new study could be found to do, you know, a type of surgery differently. That's the same way, you know, with land clearing, excavation, any construction industry, you know, you could have a new, um, a new piece of article, a new piece of information that comes out any day, you know, it could be tomorrow, it could be yesterday. You yeah. Know, could be anything that comes out that's new, you really got to suck it up and learn about it. And so that's one thing I've been really, really, really fortunate for is just, you know, learning and just soaking up from the people next to me. You know, I've had, I've met some really, really, really incredible people along the way that without them, I want to be, you know, sitting here talking to you about everything that we do today. It's just, it's truly just incredible how technology connects everybody. Nope. We've got a little bit of a glitch here in the video. Let's see if we can get that back. Hey, there we go. I think we got disconnected. Hey, yeah. Are. Sorry about that. Yeah. I don't know, but I think it might've been me because even my phone wasn't wanting to load anything properly. Oh. So I'm going to assume it's just going to be a gap in the video so we can just kind of pick up where we left off and Marlon can edit yeah. a little bit and we'll, yeah. we'll stitch it, <laughs> right. we'll stitch it together yeah, and make it work, man. Exactly. That's what they're good at, right? <laughs> yeah. That's, that's what you pay him for. So <laughs> exactly. I, hope, I hope he does it. And right. I, I like having a little problem like that. It just shows everybody else that nothing's perfect. Right. Especially with technology and everything that we do. Yeah. Well, I mean, nothing, you never have a day that's perfect in, in excavation work, man. There's always a wrench coming your way. You know, you know, whether it's just a machine going down, you don't have someone showing up, you're sick. Well, well, you can't be sick, really. And then you have someone that doesn't respond to emails. You're just relying on a lot of people to do, you know, to, to be successful. That's, you know, everyone's connected to one another. Yeah, it's. I mean, they've talked about it since biblical times, right? It takes a community to raise a child, it takes a community to grow a business. Like you can't do it alone. And whether it's team members and employees, or companies you partner with, or friends and family, customers, sometimes it 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 takes a bunch of people to be successful. Yes, exactly. And that's one of the thing you know, especially you know, growing up at you know doing this at a young age and everything like that, which I, you know, I don't like saying as well, because people look at me and they're like, oh, can you do this project? Cause you're young. And I, when I talk to them for after like 10 minutes, they're like, okay, you know, more than you feel. It's like, you know, but one of the things, you know, that was a struggle with me growing up, you know, having to, you know, when it comes to coming, having employees, you know, having people play a role in your business is that it is your child. And it's, you know, can I, can I let myself, you know, let them help me, you know, can let me help you help me kind of, kind of scenario there. So that's one of the things is like, you know, can I trust this person to go do this job? And I know I can, but it's like, I got to push myself to get out of my comfort zone a little bit, to, you know, to let them it, go to go explore, you know, do their thing, grow up. It's the hardest step for any business owner. And until you walk through it, you don't know, you, people just don't it. get it, man. No. It's like, it's the hardest thing. So I was, I mean, I was a little bit older than you when I started my first business, but I was 25. And even then at 25, I got looked at like, who's this young kid? He's just going to crash and burn quick. It wasn't until I turned 30, five years, still owning the same business. People are like, oh, maybe he's all right. You know, it took, it took five took years. Just, to hop on yeah, the train, right? Mostly because of your age, right? So even in five years from now, you're still going to be dealing with, man, that kid's awful young from the outside perspective. Right, right. Um, I don't remember where I was going with that. I got kind of sidetracked, but um, oh, <laughs> like hiring my first manager and like not being there 
on the days yes. that generate the most revenue, like it yes. was scary. Yes. And that's and more it, like how it was. We had a project out here in uh, Duluth we had to do. And it was scary. To, you know, I had to step away a lot on this project, you know, whether it's running materials, going like into new projects, you know, dealing with other stuff that I had to deal with inside the company, you know, office stuff is one of the biggest things people don't understand and kind of look over. It's, you know, almost 50 percent of what you do as a business owner, it's just, you know, stuff that you do in the office. So having to, you know, mitigate the time, not so much onto the job side, but, you know, away from it and, you know, how to delegate, you know, all my responsibilities, to somebody else was definitely something that was a, a learning curve for sure. You know, new, you how I like to say is each 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 thing that you go through that may look bad is one of the best things that can happen to you because one you're most likely not going to make that mistake again obviously depending on severity and then it also teaches you how to you know excel when you have a bad situation like that happen again I and that's one of the things that I credit to like me being not so me having a rocky start at the beginning has kind of opened my pores a little bit to you know learning what type of things that I can do, can do with things I need to avoid, you know, need to stay away from and just stuff like that. And so that's one of the things I've just kind of figured out. It's like, it's a really trial and error intricate, you know, thing, just owning a business in general, no matter what industry you're in. And it is, I think you can cut back that trial and error just a little bit. It's always going to be trial and error, but taking a few minutes or some time a day, a week and kind of visioning the outline of what the tasks are, one, yeah. giving yourself a guideline and a checklist so you're not scatterbrained. But two, when you go to replace yourself in that role, you kind of have a playbook that you can hand to that person and say, here's how we do steps Excellent. one through 10 Excellent. with invoicing or with marketing or job site prep. It, it works for everything. And just kind of building those frameworks and those checklists. It doesn't have to be perfect, but have enough so that you can show them and teach and use it as a training tool. Exactly. And not only that, that kind of goes back to, you know, having a business plan and just having, you know, set aside. One thing I really want to recommend people, especially people listening to this, is that when it comes to having a long term or short term growth goal from, uh, for your company, you really have to break it down into the point to where it's like, OK, what's actually going to be achievable? And realistically, what am I going to be capable of? capable of in the next, you know, say it's, for example, your long-term is going to be five years. What am I going to be capable of in the next five years? Whether that's not even just you, but, you know, your market that you're working with, the, the market or the area of market that you're serving, you know, you got to look at all these different things that, like you say, play huge roles in just determining your uh, your outcomes. So, you know, just being able to, I can't forget, I was going to go with that too, but kind of <laughs> just, <laughs> just lose, the shy, lose my brain here. But um, yeah, just kind of taking the time to figure out what kind of goals you want to have for your company. And that, like you said, set aside a game plan. One of the biggest things that I've kind of realized, and again, and it's just another blessing, I guess, um, from the Lord, just when being young, I was playing football when I started this company. So having school football and, you know, business, is obviously a big, a big task to chew on, but learning from football is that a coach is very, very similar to a business owner. It's almost identical. Just by the way, you have to buy people into what you're doing, your culture, how you motivate people, how you guide people in your day to day and how you can really just be the best team to win the national championship at the end of the day. So that's been one of the biggest things that I've seen. That's like the best correlation, the best way I can describe you know the best analogy that i can have is that if you can't coach you can't if you can't lead inspire which is basically all the words i found in coaching you can't coach I, you can't be a business owner well you can't be a business owner with employees i agree exactly, exactly. <laughs> I agree like that. That. Yeah. there's a lot of solopreneurs yeah. who can just keep being however they want to be good. and they'll be fine exactly. owner operators and, and stuff like that yeah and and the larger you get your business the more important that culture and that buy-in is Yes, it's it it's it, literally you can talk to CEOs of Fortune 500 companies and good ones will tell you their primary role as a CEO is to maintain the culture of the company. The business. Exactly. Because once you if you don't have good culture, you don't have anything to build on. That's really one of the biggest foundations, because you can have the guy in the field, because one of the biggest discrepancies, discrepancies when it comes to the industry is that the people in the field work harder than people in the office. If you can get the guys in the field and the guys in the office to coordinate and be able to work as a cohesive one and buy into the same buy into the same project, buy into the same day-to-day, -day, you know, whether it's training, going and, you know, submitting a, a bid or just going out and exec executing your project. If you can have them buy into all that together and knowing that they're playing a role, even if it doesn't, if, even if you don't see a physical role happening, you're playing a role just by being a part of the team. If you can get someone to buy into that, I truly believe that you can 
he can accomplish any task that requires any amount of voice. Absolutely. There's a story, and I don't remember where I read about it, but it's a true story, and it was years ago, but this doctor, he was a cardiologist, and he was leaving the office one day, and he stopped in to use the restroom on the way out, and when he went in there, the janitor was in there, and this was his own office. It's not at a hospital. This was his own center. And the, and the janitor's on his hands and knees with like scrubbing the baseboards right. around the urinals and toilets. And the, and the doctor just kind of stood there for a minute and was like, wow, this guy's really dedicated to janitorial services. And yeah, he looked at him and he's just like, he's like, hey, I just want to, I just have to ask you, like, like your dedication, I really appreciate it. I just want to thank you for your hard work. And the janitor looked at him and goes, doctor, we cure people's bad hearts. We can't have them getting an infection while they're in our building. The fucking janitor said, we cure people's hearts. Like he was bought in part of the team. It's just, and that's it's just crazy. Like even hearing stuff like that and just seeing how like, cause I like, I'm a person that when I hear stuff, I can like, as you're telling that story, I was seeing a janitor scrubbing on the floor and everything in my mind. So just be able to see that and just kind of see how that, like how that would have played out is crazy. Cause that's the same way how it would have been with the laborer. You know, that's like when a, an estimator goes out to the job site and sees the laborer digging a sylphin's trench. And it's like, thank you just for, you know, doing, working hard. Cause we could have a machine out here, but we don't have one right now. You're digging it with a hand and shovel. He's like, we can't have the sentiment leaving the job site. It's just, we can't afford it. That is one of the biggest things, especially as if, if you're an employee listening to this or even a business owner, you're going to have someone that's willing to go the extra mile while you're not there and have that integrity to do what the janitor was doing. That story that you just told, that's one of the, that's one of the greenest flags. I yeah. look that over the spirit sometimes. <laughs> and from my personal the experience, the, the kicker isn't like, you're going to find somebody that does that. It's just people are just built that way. They want to be a part of the team. They want to help you grow. The hard part as the leader mm. is putting that guy in a box. And exactly. taking away that drive and that passion they have because we're like, no, 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 that's not your role. Just do this. And then they kind of lose motivation. So it's, it's a, it's a, it's like a ballet dance of finding them and line, then even. keeping them on track, but also giving them enough freedom to feel like they're important to, with the project and the decisions. And that's where I feel like, you know, employment advancements are super big. Obviously, you can't do them like, you know, every two, you know, you can't do them super consistently. But having the right proper, you know, having the proper employee advancements, whether it's, you know, from uh, operator to head operator role, you know, head operator, to foreman role, whatever the case may be, you know, foreman to superintendent. It's just having that opportunity to be able to increase people's uh in, in, you know responsibilities others as, as they're progressing with your company it's one of the best things that you can do because like you said it just re it kind of re-sparks that fire of their investment of what they're yeah. doing it makes them feel like they're you know they're involved and what they're they're contributing their it, time to something that great it, absolutely learning something new automatically associates more confidence they're better employees but they associate you as a great leader because you're making them better and we found with the companies we worked with it doesn't have to be job related Right. You got three or four guys that are full time on your crew, right. bring in your financial advisor and have them talk about Roth IRAs and 401ks and investment strategies Personal and showing what comp like that still makes that person a better person, even though it's and not it, job skill related. So there's so many things you can bring in to make them better men, better females, better right. people that will make them better employees also. One of the best things that I can relate to that is build with Have you, you know, build with Aaron Witt and all that. Yeah. Yeah. That they talk about it all the time, just invest into, you know, your people and what you have and what you have really, it's like what you rely on to make yourself and make your company, mm -hmm. you know, operate function. So that's one of the best, biggest things, you know, whether it's like you said, the best way I can describe it is that if you can go ahead and take a person that doesn't know how to operate or a person that's just a labor hand and you can turn them to, you know, one of the best operators just by investing the time, or you can turn them into, you know, a better person, whether it becomes, you know, morals, principles, yeah. just how you teach them about, you know, the things, the way you run yourself and, you know, convey, <laughs> excuse me, the way you, you know, conduct yourself and run your company. That's one of the biggest things that have, you know, a bigger impact than just, you know, yeah. having a job and, you know, growing up in, in, in uh, rankings. But I, I think as a business owner, we typically get tunnel vision. We're always yeah. thinking about the company, the business, how to make it grow. So when we get that input from outside sources saying invest in your people. We automatically go to job related investments. 
new technologies, better ways to do the job. And like, we don't think outside that box saying, Hey, this kid dropped out of high school for reasons in his family that worked out. What if I paid for his GED? Right? Like, like it's, that. but that's still an investment in your team members, even though it doesn't naturally correlate. The, There's not a the KPI business. you can track to see exactly. the outcome of that, but I guarantee you he's going to work harder because his confidence grows. He's got that education now same with the financial literacy and there's so many things in life that we could use as investing into our people we just got to get out of our tunnel and say hey and it's see, more than just the business it's a really big perspective things as well because with that you know you can really just by providing someone with the confidence confidence is key no matter what i feel like confidence is one of the biggest things to do you know i tell myself if i'm if i'm not confident when i go to bid a job i'm not going to take the job because I, I if i'm not confident when doing it everything else is just going to go to hell so you know being able to invest you know confidence and just different things into you know the people that you work with i feel like it's going to be the biggest part especially with the confidence having the biggest role really because if i could go out and tell someone hey you know i want you to do I want you to like 1500 feet of self in three days. So that's what 500 feet a day. If I can tell a crew to do that and I can be like, I'm confident you guys are going to hit this deadline and I can give them, you know, the kind of boost that they would need, to, the, the mental boost really that they would need to get it done. I feel like that would be a better drive than any other, you know, monetary value that I could really provide unless it's, you know, an excellent, an expansion amount of dollars. But, you know, being able to provide that mindset with other people and really just, like you said, lead and inspire is one of the biggest things you can do. Yeah. And, we forget that it's competence, yes, training, time on job, whatever else that actually breeds confidence. Exactly. The first exactly. time you do anything, you have no confidence in yourself in doing it. The twentieth time, your confidence level is a lot higher. The thousandth time, you're like, yeah, I got it. It's easy. That's, that's the same way it goes. That's how it was when we started jobs. Like when I first started my first backyard job, I was like, okay, I could do it, but can I do? It? You know, I haven't. I don't have a. I don't have a track record of it. So can I do it? I'm like, okay, after five jobs, I can do it. Ten jobs, all right. What's what's next? You know, it's just that growth factor. You know, trying to figure all that out. So it's really cool, just how all aspects of life and like really when I started, one of the biggest things. Uh, excuse me, one of my biggest takeaways from running this company is just like the perspective. I, I've really been able to look at things from like a, an outside 3D perspective a lot better than I have been before. And I've really been able to try to break that tunnel like you're talking about that a lot of business owners do have, you know, trying to see stuff from other people's eyes, you know, whether it's being self-aware, being aware of other people on the job site, how they may react to the, you know, the way someone's talking to them and stuff like that. Just little cues like that. I started to get really good at picking up on it. That's something that I feel like is really a necessity for uh, this type of work. It, well, it's necessity for any kind of work. You know, awareness is so underestimated of the importance of it. Especially um, how you make someone feel, you know, a good, a, a person that's happy with their working is going to be, it's going to be a productive worker than someone that's working for the dollar. Yeah. I can make my guys laugh, you know, at least five times on the job site, you know, before lunchtime, I did my job, you know, yeah. that's one of the biggest things. Just making what they do because we construction is some nitty gritty hard work, and so trying to make it as you know enjoyable as possible is just one of the one of the best things that I feel like that one of the things I feel like you need to I feel like a person should take a lot of time into investing into. Yeah, and 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 going back to that competence, confidence. Like when you start getting into certain areas, like say a problem arises on the job site and it's not really in your competent realm, and you got to figure out a solution for it. I feel too many guys just figure out the solution to that specific problem without looking at it saying what does this solution provide for potential problems since it's something we haven't done? Like, where's that awareness to go? How does this outcome dictate the next two, three, four steps of the project? Exactly. And go on with that, trying to figure out the why. Um, for me personally, I don't know how it may be for some other people, but when I figure out the why and how things work, I'm more dedicated and more you know, willing to figure out how it works. So for example, when I was in high school, if a teacher was tell us, hey, do this or just do this you know, assignment, I'll be like, why? Or I'll think in my head, I'll be like, why do we have to do this? Because I'm generally curious, you know, how, like, I want to know how it's going to contribute me and if I'm going to be strictly a waste of time. But if I could figure out the why, just, you know, as a personal level, just figuring out why some things work, like whether it's either in construction or just, you know, in life in general, like why does a plane fly? You know, it's bringing out the why and things make it so much more interesting because you figure out the intricacies of it. And that just pulls you in more because you figure out there's more to learn. And there goes back to that, that topic I was talking about. Just you got to love learning. That's yeah. one of the biggest things about life. You got to love learning. 
we're kindred spirits, Jonah, because I'm terrible when it comes to that. I was laughing while you're talking about that because all I could think about was me investing a bunch of money in guitar lessons. <laughs> and, bar- and I never learned anything on the guitar because the whole class, I'm like, but what's the theory behind that? Or why does that G sound that? And, and I couldn't get past the why. Yes. And, the and, why and I wasted, it? I don't know how many hundreds of dollars and how many hours of my life going to lessons. <laughs> and I get home like, well, shit, I didn't learn how to play it. I just kept asking questions about why, why it sounds that way or why does the G <laughs> and the E go together? Because I'm the so same. Like, my curiosity just gets the best of me. Always. And I feel like that's the only reason that I'm so driven. It's just like, I'm so curious about everything. Like, I credit, obviously the machines are cool and stuff, but like, why do the machines work the way they do? Like, I still think about it sometimes just like crazy how we pull just as like, just as a society or as people, we've taken random parts of the earth, metal, plastic, everything like that, and combined it to, you know, computers, machines, just like, it's crazy how that works. And like, why does it work? You know, how does everything, you know, and, and, you know, in turn work with one another, how does a small gear move, you know, lift 50,000 pounds? It's, yeah. it's crazy to think about stuff like that. It does. It does. And and especially with the excavation equipment, when you can start understanding why the why behind some of those equipment, then you can really figure out they're probably capable of doing a lot more than than what you think of as a business owner. And oh, employee. yeah. And you, and you do have to figure out the why, because if you don't figure out the why, you're not going to be able to fix yeah. your machines. For the break. <laughs> oh, absolutely. That part, too. Yeah. Right. But I mean, you th- <laughs> take about this way. That, that forestry mulching head attachment comes out. I don't know how many years ago that came out. Yeah. I think I, I it was a, that. Like it was yeah, brand it new to the industry. In like, yeah. It was like super innovative. Yeah. You talk about embracing new technology. The guys that were doing it the old school way said that thing's garbage. It would never replace what we do. They're probably not in business anymore. Or they've added that piece to their business to stay in business. Right. But if you're if they really fought it, they're not in business anymore. And then the ones that embraced it and brought it in for certain aspects of jobs were able to grow and do different types of work, be more affordable and more profitable in some smaller to mid-sized jobs. And the ones that figured out why that machine was good for different types of applications are the ones that maximized its efficiency in those applications. Exactly. And like I said, figuring out the why is the biggest part. And another thing too, just when you were talking about this, reminding me is timing is, it, the timing is everything. So the people that obviously started out when, like you said, forestry mulching and the drum head first got, you know, released into the market and, you know, started really hitting that market hard or some of the biggest land clear companies right now. Just as times progress, um, the first one of them in our area that I can name is LRS, LRS Services. Um, another one is Outback Land Clearing um, and Forestry Mulching. They both started at a super young age, likewise, and they Hit, they had so basically when they first started out, forestry mulching was just now you know being introduced into the market. And forestry mulching is a really it's a thing that it doesn't take a lot of overhead to get into, and it's not hard to get your name out there and expose. So those guys having you know the record or not the records, but the connections they had and the networking they had back then, just from their you know forestry mulching contacts, those people have you know gone and grown you know to be you know residential developers now and so on and so forth. So just having that that int- introduction to the market early kind of sets you apart really really sets you apart better, but it's not an excuse not to work hard if you uh, come in late. Yeah. And, and I really think, especially when you get into like forestry mulching, doubling down on that niche, like our, I have a good friend, Zach down in Texas, they mm-hmm. own Stuart Ranch Services. He started out with a John Deere 333, had a forestry head, was doing some other excavation work, but he quickly realized that he was not getting opportunities in the bigger land clearing jobs because he was a jack of all trades. He only had a forestry head and he just made the commitment one day. And I remember we were on the phone and he's just like, I'm selling all my equipment and I'm buying a dedicated mulcher. Ooh, right. So now they have two dedicated mulchers. He's got his own semi truck. And this is all in a matter of 30 months. Like he went from doing 500,000 a year in business to now he's, I think he's over a million and a half, 2 million. I, if I had to guess, he hasn't told me. That's the same but, way. But like he just doubled down on his niche and he just cut all the other stuff out. Like you can't the be doubling everything down on the niche is one of the best things because we were a jack of all trades. So, you know, if you would have looked at my my our ads and logos and everything like that from like 2020, 2021, you would see grading, pond work, drainage, uh, stormwater, everything, the whole nine yards, right? But now you only see two things that are really predominantly advertised and just growing it in, just figure out where there's a gap in your market and where you can kind of fit into and, you know, figure out what's the best service to provide. Cause at the end of the day, if you're a jack of all trades, it shouldn't be hard to, you know, if you just put down the other four and, you know, focus on two, focus on one. So that's one of the biggest things that I figure out and learn over time is that 
no matter how, if you're starting out, it's not a bad thing to be a jack of all trades because you get exposure to everything yeah. that you will want. It kind of gives you a plethora of options to pursue. But if you, once you start, you know, progressing, you know, start getting to a little bit more consistently, definitely figure out a niche because that's going to be, you know, what separates you. And that's what people are going to remember you for. They're not going to remember you for being, you know, a pond, land clearing, and rug and excavating company. It's going to be one or two things at most. Yeah. The riches are in the niches, man. Mm, they, I like that. I'm using that Rich, now. Riches are in the niches. Thank <laughs> you, Alex from Ozzy, for that one. Um, and I want to expand a little bit on that gap because, I mean, I think, again, it's one of those topics that someone's like, hey, find a gap in the market and fill it. And it's so easy Not to go, either. the market's full in my area. There is no gap in the market. People are offering all these different services. Where do I fit into a new gap? The gap doesn't always have to be the service. The gap can be the value you provide that they're not providing in the same service. Exactly. One of the biggest things that I feel like a takeaway that someone starting out should really look into, uh, they want them to maximize their uh, their exposures, figure out what what all right, what figure out what human errors are like are going wrong, for example. So it's, are you having a communication error? If you were a contractor and I was a contractor and I heard you were having communication error, you didn't respond back to your bids fast enough. I'm going to make sure I respond back to my all my bids and everything within the 30 minutes or an hour. You know, figure out what type of stuff that people are doing well and then hone in on those things. And once those, you know, say it's your production is doing good and then you can, your communication is doing good. You have those two factors that are doing great. Take those two and grow those hard and then start figuring out what other people are still doing good at right. and be better at that. It, always find an area to be better than, than your competitors. And your example of that with the getting back to the bids you could be 7% higher than all the other ones. But if you've got a relationship and a track record with that guy of, I never have to track him down. He's always there the day he says he's going to be there. He's never put a project behind schedule. That 7%'s irrelevant. Gone. Gone. They don't even, they, they really don't like, they don't even consider it really. If you can sell yourself, like you are the best option in the area and that if someone went with another option that you would have to either come back and clean up their mess or that you would have to really just, they would be missing out on a great opportunity. If you can really sell that point about you. And so what you're doing is just going to be a great, you know, what you're, what you're going to provide is going to be a great benefit for the client. You, you win any job. Obviously, you know, some jobs are people strictly looking for the lowest number, right. but the majority of people are, you know, that, that are, really just wanting a, a general number. Some may be higher, some may be lower, but we've definitely been the highest and still got in the bid. And we've definitely been in the middle ground and there's been people lower than us and we still got in the bid. Just by the way, you know, we communicate with people, we execute our bids the way we're, you know, efficient with, we do the work and just having a good track rec rep rep record and a good history really separates you uh, from that, from that, uh, from your competitors. Listen, if it was all price driven, we'd all be driving $4,000 vehicles like from 1988. Mm -hmm. Construction want to be an industry that because it's not to. price, it's value. It is. It's and when really contractors is. can learn to quit bidding on price and quit offering an hourly rate, God, go back to work. That's what you're doing. You just got a job. See how what I'm gonna give a little secret away. If you can sell yourself as like, I'm really here for the customer's best interest, not even just for the project, but their best interest for their budget, their best interest for their time frame. If you can be accommodant, if you can put yourself personal gains and yourself aside for a second and really focus on the client, make them the number one priority, number one priority, you will be, you will be all right. I mean, very that's successful. one of the biggest things. People prioritize themselves too much as an industry that relies strictly on other people that, that we need to, you know, be afloat. So being, again, just being self-aware and just being, you know, I, right, I could put my needs and wants here for the side for a little bit, just to be able to, you know, help this person out, whether it's, you know, for a day job, that day job that someone just need a little help with, that's like a little $500 job that you just you don't, you don't have to charge them for that can lead you to more work. Whether they want to share that with, you know, their friends, you know, their friends have connections with, you know, commercial work, governmental work, residential, you know, high end residential work. So it's just the cost of opportunity is how I like to put it. Yeah. I mean, it's that saying, right? The more people you help reach where they're, they're where they're going, the quicker you, the more gets back to you. you exactly. So putting exactly. those people's needs in front of them. And I don't, I don't think you have to go do work for free or go do those $300 jobs. But I do believe that you have to approach every job as a solution to a problem. Exactly. I tell this, I tell everybody this, like you do not own a service company, even though excavation is a service, you own a problem solution business. Exactly. Nobody's calling you because everything's hunky dory. Like the septic's broken, 
the fields are eroding. Like there's there's a problem they're having. And you're not selling the excavation service. You're selling the solution to their problem. And you can provide enough value in your solution, competency in the in the work that you do and, and the trust that you have with them. Price is really irrelevant. And when you start putting that into your estimates, they're comparing apples to oranges. Exactly. This guy says 1,500 feet of silt fence. Well, this guy says 1,500 feet of silt fence, 100% clean up, finished within four days, guaranteed that the fence doesn't rip in 90 days. Like, it's not apple, it's apples to oranges. It's like, that's, that's like one of the best things I've heard. Because one of the things that I see is that if you can't really be able to articulate yourself that you're trying to be there for the best interest of the, comp- the client. So, for example... One thing that I will recommend that people do is give your give your your client your customer options. So, like you said, they're here for a problem. They don't know how to solve this. They're relying on you, your expertise, to get them out of this rut. So, if you are trying to go into this as like a new thing and you don't know if you could do it, don't waste people's time and don't put them in, you know in a deeper problem that they're already in. So, give them when you're submitting bid and you're already confident that you can do the work and all that. Give them an option of different things like that they could do that's either, you know, a little bit more expensive, but that's a little bit long-term, less maintenance, something that's moderate, but, you know, so you still have maintenance or something that's high maintenance, but it's a lower, you know, initial cost. Figure out what people need and what fits different people, each person, you know, best, because each person is going to be different. So figure out what bid's going to fit, you know, Jerry, uh, Jeff the best, you know, Jerry's going to be the best, and, you know, and, and yep. what's going to fit Rob the best. So and- just figuring out how you can be, you know, a broad scale, you know, a how you can be a broad scale company that fits to what every person needs. A hundred percent. And and I think a lot of contractors and business owners hear that and they start thinking they got to drop a price for one guy. Mm-hmm. Listen, you do not drop your price on the value you provide. You drop the value to meet the budget that the customer has. Exactly. And not only that, you got to understand when it goes, like I was saying, go back to cost of opportunity. If you have a job that it's a, it's a pretty good project and you, you're confident that you, that you can get in, you know, client wants to go with you, but you kind of have a feeling that's going to be high competitive and it's going to be, you know, it's going to be high competition with a tighter budget. That's when the sales and what we're talking about right now is really, really going to shine. That's when it's really going to be, that's when it's going to really separate you. Absolutely. Nope. And then when you start getting the real tight competition, that's where it's time to look internally to figure out where you can be more effective and how to improve your efficiencies. Exactly. And that's when that self-awareness comes into play and, you know, figure out what we need to put to the side. You know, I can have three excavators and two dozers on a clearing job, but if it's more, you know, grubbing and it's clearing, the excavators aren't going to help more than, you know, the rakes will. So if we have a job that's, you know, barely any grown trees and it's just, you know, kind of shrubs and everything like that, you know, better than three excavators and two dozers, you know, you rather say, you know, three dozers and, you know, two excavators, you know, what have you, because that's what's going to be more efficient. So kind of taking that self, that uh, self-improvement and just kind of when you, one thing we like to do, we start doing is um, at the end of every project, do a good project analysis on what you really effed up on and be honest with yourself. Um, that's one of the things I've had to show with is being honest with myself and what we mess up on and what we're good at. And so be honest with yourself, figure out what you're not good at and what you mess up on and figure out what you need to do to correct that. Cause the faster you get projects done, the more work that's going to come back to you. Yeah. And self-awareness is a big one, man. Whether it's for your personal life or your business, mm-hmm. you have to be honest with yourself. Yeah. That's one of the biggest things I struggle with. I mean, I told myself, (laughs) this cracks me up every time. I told myself when I first started that I could grade, this is my second job. I could grade a 10,000 square foot house lot with no, uh, no grade laser or anything like that. Strictly by eye. Guess how much it was off from one corner to corner? Two feet. Uh, Two feet. Two feet. (laughs) Two feet. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) When you told me that, I was like, oh, (laughs) that's why you need a laser. So different learning stuff and being self-aware. If I wasn't, it was crazy because people talk about it and I look back on it um, and just, I did have a lot of confidence going into this and that's what kind of helped me get through the, the harsher times. But there was a point where I look back on it and I think about it, like, for example, that job, I had no, I had no right to have as much confidence going to that project and talking about, you know, doing a, a house lot with no gray laser or anything like that. With only two jobs, low. Jody, you, gotta, you didn't. Jody, you didn't have confidence because you need competence to have confidence. Exactly. Lack <laughs> of competence just makes you cocky. I had a big ego. That's what <laughs> it I just had. makes I you a, cocky. I, yeah, I had, I had a big ego for yeah. no reason. Yeah, and 
I, I thought I was on top of the world because I knew how to make a couple phone calls and schedule a machine to go out to a job. Yeah, <laughs> love yeah, how that works. <laughs> that's how it goes, man. Oh, that's hilarious. That's hilarious, oh, yeah. man. <laughs> but no, uh, having that opportunity, just you know, and I'm like I said, I'm, everything happens for a reason. That's one of the biggest things that I. That's my that's my life slogan. Everything happens for a reason. So I'm definitely happy that I was able to get that that all that ego, egotistic, you know, narcissistic, you know, business owner vibes out. You know, then we yeah. really do big of work we saw a really really small name not many not too many people knew us and then i was able to take that you know i want to say six months period after that uh project and just really was self-aware and just sorry and that's why i really started looking at things from an outside perspective it's like how do i look to the person you know how do i look coming in as a person that's like young doesn't look too that doesn't look like the can of the project you know how would i look coming into a job like that and being over cocky so yeah and another thing i think kind of played a role into that was that with me being young, I had to be, you know, that overconfident, over cocky guy to even have a foot in the door. So definitely finding that green line, that middle line there was uh, was a little hard, but I'm glad I found it now. Absolutely. So one of the things you talk about is you're really proud at how efficient you've become, especially on projects you've done multiple times or the service that you provided multiple times. Sorry, the solution you provided multiple times. <laughs> how has how has stepping back and like seeing the forest through the trees and reassessing and being honest with yourself, how has that affected your ability to increase your efficiencies within your business faster than than most companies? Without taking that time, I want to be you know I want, we want to be getting better each day. Um, so one thing that I learned. Is day by day we get better and better until we can't be beat. I learned that in football, and so that stuck with me to this day. So if I hadn't taken the time to really just to understand what we were good at, because that was the biggest thing, you know, being a jack of all trades and kind of condensing down to two things that it sucks that we're not going to have the opportunities like to do these projects anymore, but how can we be more efficient in what we do? And so taking that time is really just maximize our potential, you know, in the work that we do, because now we did it for that job. That I was just telling you about, we had, uh, that had the part-time workers on and all that. And we, we laid 1500 feet of still fence. We cleared a 700 foot easement for a sewer line and then put up the double row still fence, which was 1500 feet in the uh, end. We got all that done in less than five days. And so being able to take the time on the jobs prior and figure out what we need to do really, really shine on that project. Cause we were on a tight, tight schedule, tight deadline, tight budget, and having the prior, you know, analysis and prior studies and research from our other projects and our, our team and seeing what we're good at and what we're capable of producing in-house, taking that time to really hone in and figure out what, you know, figure out those, that data that we needed really set us aside and really set us apart on that, on the project that we did, on that project we did. Yeah. Great, great insight on that. It's, it's so important to stop stressing about the future and start learning from the past. Exactly. And that's one of the biggest things too. It's like, I'll catch myself just like, even just I'll catch like waves, just like, whoa, like this, that's a lot to bite off. Cause I look at long-term goals that I have set aside for myself with the company, you know, the people that we have within the company, you know, trying to reach those goals in a, you know, in a X amount of time, it's kind of scary. It's a big bite that you off. And so taking the time to really step back and, you know, like I said, day by day, we get better and better. It's a lot easier to consume than, you know, one big bite of like, okay, we got to do all this or, well, we can do this, 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 that's going to lead to that goal. You know, it's going to take a little bit more time, but it's going to be more manageable, less, less headache, less stress. Yeah, it, it's it's funny because I have a good friend of mine. He's a professional photographer. <clears throat> I mean, if you've ever seen a Guns and Ammo magazine at the grocery store, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's done the photos on that and like thirteen uh, other. I mean, so he's he's big time professional photographer, and he always tells me when we're doing our marketing, like, hey, there's there's four views. Most people only take three. You have the top view, the front view, and the side view. He's like, but what about the back view? Like. What does the product look like after the attachments done it? Don't forget to look backwards. Exactly. And and I heard somebody talking about, you know, when we set goals for ourselves, before we reach the actual goal, we'll move the goalpost. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, hey, I want to do a million dollars in business this year. And you get to like 850, and you're like, oh, I bet we can do 1250. Like we just move the damn goalpost. We don't know how, I, we're just wired that way. We just always constantly are moving our goalposts forward. And then we always feel a little bit not worthy enough because we didn't hit the the, mo the new goalpost. We want it, yep. Right? So the only way that you can really look back and see your growth is to turn around 
and say, hey, a year ago when I set that goal to be at a million, we were at 350,000. That's how it was. We had an efficiency of, you know, 35% net profit. Right. Like, where are we? Like, And that's when you actually can start growing more than always focusing on what's tomorrow. Exactly. You know, taking the time to really step back, like you said, and just really look at what's behind you. You'd be surprised about how, one, how far you've come and two, how far you've, and how many goals you've exceeded and passed, you know, without even realizing it. I, I was doing the math earlier, earlier this year. We had set a um, a revenue goal that we wanted to reach for last year, and I didn't think we reached that goal. But I went back finally because taxis and all that added up all the funds and everything, and we had exceeded that goal that we had set. So just really taking the time, like you said, to really step back, look at everything from not even just from the three sides, but all four sides, including the ones behind you, and seeing how one the product that you produce, how it's last, and two how it's you know improved and you know contributed to your success and moving yeah. forward in your. And the nice thing about when you look backwards. You can find out where you excelled and where you struggled. And then you can take the approach that, you, that you're you really good at and ask yourself, why did we excel here? Why did we struggle here? And you can literally exactly. build out the roadmap for what you want to keep improving on or what you need to fix to get exactly. better overall. And one of the biggest things is that, like you said, having a roadmap is what's going to really a lot of people you'd be surprised don't have don't have a roadmap for the company. Yeah. Just between talking to people and just really doing a lot of research, you come to understand that a lot of people are really just winging it once they get into the first couple of years of business. And by the time they figure out, you know, I need a plan, I need this, you know, the beer to keep this going, yeah. it's too late. I forgot what the stat was, but it's like some, it's like I think over 50% or 60% of businesses, small businesses in within the first three years of business. 80%. 80%, exactly. 80% so. in the first two years. And you want to hear the the, the staggering fact? Mm. So you have 20% of all small businesses succeed after two years. That 20% at the five-year mark, 80% of the 20% fail within yeah. five years. So, and that's what it goes back to what I'm saying. I feel like a lot of people, obviously it doesn't apply to everybody, but I feel like most people get into this industry because from the outside in, it really looks like a glamorous industry. People see all the cool machines, all the tinted windows, all the decals, all the cool earth you're moving. But people don't really understand, you know, if you're doing a job that most of these big equipment's on, you're doing, you're moving almost 200,000 yards. For example, a project we just looked at yesterday, it was 200,000 yards worth of earth that had to be moved. And a lot of people look at that. It's like, oh my gosh, that's like a big project. That's a money, that's a money project. But people don't understand the intricate intricacies of that project you know if you lose thirty thousand yards which is very very easy to do on a project like that you'll go bankrupt i mean there was a project right down the road from me uh from us in alpharetta that uh i believe an out-of-state contractor had to do a hotel for and they got in over their head and they had all the machines and everything like that but they, they underestimated on their cubic yards and they ended up going bankrupt on that project because of it's, it so it's crazy how people just you really the amount of time it takes to to not just do it, but to understand how stuff needs to work and then set goals, but also really realistic goals. Cause if you set a good goal for yourself, that's, you know, you, it may seem glamorous and good yeah. at the start, but if you try to push hard for that goal and it's too early, you could put yourself under, you know, if you want to buy two pieces of equipment this year, but you don't, you don't have enough work for two pieces of equipment, but you're still so pushing hard to, you know, meet that goal and it's not realistic to achieve it. You're just going to put yourself, you know, it's going to be a curse. You're going to put yourself back under. Yeah. And it's, you know, those guys that keep like yourself, even <clears throat> you're very aware of it. But when you start getting into the larger size dirt projects, which is more commercial size, okay. you know, if you if you lose, if you miss material estimates on a backyard by 4%, you're like, oh, well, well, well we eat it. It's like $150, you know, right? We'll, we'll eat it. it. Right. But you miss yeah, exactly. 4% on 200,000 yards. Do that's the a math. lot of money. That's it's a lot, a lot money. of you're money. Charging was, you know, between 15, 30 yards per or $30, 15 to 15 to $30 per yard, you know, it kind of varies on the project, but you add that up, you know, 4% of, you know, 200, 400 or 200,000 yards. It's a big project that, you know, you lost almost $50,000 or not more on. And that stuff, that's business profit that you set aside, or that's profit that's coming either from yeah. your equipment, labor, it's got to come from somewhere. So, I mean, I suck at math. And if you're watching this, you can double check me, but off the top of my <laughs> head, 4% of 200,000 is 8,000 yards, 8,000 at $15. That's over a hundred grand. Right there. Gone. So you yeah. went from $150 mistake, whoops, to same, same calculation error, but it just, yeah. it just expands in size.
Exactly, exactly. And, and being able to, and one of the biggest things I got to say is that a lot of stuff that we, a lot of stuff in the industry that you do, it's going to reflect on one another. So the same work that you do for a house lot, it's going to be, generally speaking, it's going to be the same for, you know, clearing 20, 30 acres, you're just doing more repetitively. So being able to just take the time and just understand that if you can hone in and just figure out, you know, how to do the little stuff right it will reflect on the bigger stuff and that comes with you know growing slow not i say this growing slow because we've grown pretty fast but growing at a moderate rate and just not buying up more than you can chew too often um and i, I would actually like, i don't want to cut you off but i'm going to <laughs> sorry i don't think the growth good. rates is important as this this the strategy behind the growth Exactly. Exactly. People can grow. People can get, I mean, there's nothing stopping someone that owns a skisser right now for taking a 30 acre project, but can you, you know clear 30 acres? Do you know what it takes to clear 30 acres? You're not doing it efficiently because right. by the time you start getting to these larger projects, the thresholds and for time and everything change. But let's say Jonah, you're like, Hey, I, in the next year, I want to grow to three crews and 30 employees, you know, and 20 employees. Right. Like that's a great dream. <laughs> but when you go, Hey, we're going to need to have three seasoned True leaders, true leaders that can run like okay so we have specific roles we need to fill we're gonna have this much cash we're gonna need available for that that growth we're gonna need to be bidding on jobs at this size and not this size anymore get in consistently like, but again like if you're strategic i don't think growth the way people view it from the outside is relevant exactly i mean people look at people look at me honestly i'll tell you right now just based on the groups i'm in the people that i talk to people look at me like i don't know a thing in the world and that i'm just some internet dude a lot of the guys and you know the groups i'm in i because I, I like i said i didn't have any people that you know grew up in the industry before me so i really really relied on facebook you know joining these different groups asking different questions and just as i'm learning you know asking more intricate questions and it may seem like i'm just a person that's trying to you know gain info on you and whatever and whatnot but I'm just a person that's trying to learn and is trying to grow and stuff like that. So being able to people look at our growth and our success and all that, it's just like, oh, this is just temporary or he doesn't know how to do this or he doesn't know how to do that. OK, we'll sit back and wait and you'll see some really cool stuff start to start to formulate. And it sucks, too, but it's like it's a it's a fire that's under your butt that kind of lets your ass to you know get up and push a little bit harder every day. Yeah. And. I'm a firm believer, man. I don't care if it's your close circle of friends and family or the second or third circle. If nobody's telling you that you can fail or you don't have a clue what you're doing, then you're not aspiring to be big enough. Exactly. You need someone that's going to tell you straight up that what you're doing is wrong or what you, you need to look at this you know, differently. You need to pursue this, you know, this goal do it this way, but do it a little bit slower. So you don't get in over, in over your head. Yeah. And you know, thank God, I, I know my, I have two amazing parents to help me with that. I have two older brothers that just, that guide me all the way, uh, just from, from when I started all the way up into now, they've, everyone in my family has played a huge role in, into the success of my business and success that we have now. So without them, without the people that, you know, like you said, without the village, this is, this isn't anything. Yeah. I mean, I look back at Skid Steer Nation when I was telling people I was going to start an online store selling Skid Steer attachments. I had a lot of people that were like, that's never going to work. That's stupid. Look at you now. And I'm like, well, I mean, and we're still small in the grand scheme of like some of the companies that are out there. But I'm like, well, there's a reason I don't sell 18 varieties of a 78 inch standard bucket because those are down <laughs> the street. Right. Do something it was strategic growth. Like, Hey, let's find unique products that aren't in every market. Every dealer doesn't carry OEMs don't make so we can build a catalog of products that make people more efficient with the work they do with specialized attachments that they can't get down the road at the dealership. Exactly. And one of the biggest things too, is that building a brand it really is, I'm sure this is a big secret, but building a brand is what people don't do. A lot of the old heads in the industry and all that, they don't really understand that technology is growing at a rapid rate and that you need to you know, have some online presence of what, of, you know, some form and whatnot, because as these new, as these you know, already, you know, for example, Holder Construction, you know, $4.5 billion a year, they're growing with their with technology in, in their industry and all that. So be able to grow with the things that may not seem comfortable to grow with, for example, like how you would with the, uh, the fortune mulches and the drum mulches and all that. If you don't grow to build your brand, you kind of you kind of set yourself back a little bit because, like you said, with Skiss Your Nation, you could have gone and, and done you know seventy eight different buckets, but yeah. you figured out what people weren't doing. That's grown your name, and now you can still advertise all those different buckets if you wanted to. You will have a higher a higher return rate than you would if you didn't build that brand. You kind of take that time aside to focus yeah. on the other. 
and, and like to. now we've actually niched down more. We'll sell to people that own their own property. We'll sell to farmers that need the stuff around there. We just don't spend a lot of effort attracting those clients. My vision is to be like, hey, if we, I want to be the guy that's a small excavation company or mid-sized excavation company. I want that to be my core customer. Exactly. And it's more, it, I mean, that was the driving reason we started the podcast. Because like, hey, if we can do these interviews and people can learn and they associate Skid Steer Nation with some of that growth, I'm hoping as a byproduct that as they grow their business, they come to us for their attachment needs. It's a it's a nice little circle there. Right. Exactly. And it's like you said, that strategic business. I love the way you put it. That's the first time I heard that. And it's really, it's really applied to, it's the best way to describe how we've kind of grown over these past couple of years. But the strategic planning that you need is one of the biggest things that I feel like now that I'm looking at is one of the best things that you could really set aside. If you can set aside, uh, whether it's monetary, uh, physical, uh, personal goals, just within your company, you know, for having your employees and all that, you can set those goals aside and really be honest, you know, set aside the strategic plan to get to those goals in the time frame that you want to because at the end of the day it is possible you just need to have the right resources in place to achieve it if you can get those resources in place that strategic plan can get you going up and out of here absolutely man jonah i could talk to you all afternoon i know you've got some other appointments this afternoon you got to get to so i can't thank you enough for coming on your your excitement your enthusiasm your thirst for knowledge it you, you've got me excited today man so thank you Thank you, Ron. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. Like I said, it's this is amazing. This has been a blessing to even talk to you today. Seeing you post everything all the way from back then, from 2021 to now, it's just a full circle moment, that, full circle moment down here. So That's I want awesome. to thank you. Thank, thank you uh, just for having us on. You're so welcome, man. And uh, you've, you've made my day today. And this is the reason why we do this stuff. It's like, I love doing these interviews, but when we can actually connect with people we've touched and that have inspired or educated along the way, it's just like, that fills my cup and, and that makes my day. So thanks so much, Jonah. Of course. Thank you, Ryan. Awesome. Well, guys, if you're out there and you're, you're, you're listening to Jonah's story and you're seeing his strategic growth and you just kind of feel like you're at an end pass and you're a little unsure what steps to take to get to that next level in your business, we do have a program for you. It's called Groundbreaking Growth. You can go to groundbreakinggrowth.com. It is our coaching and consulting business where we actually teach you how to operate and build a business, not to actually dig the dirt. Go over there, take a look at our philosophies. If you've listened to the podcast, you know what our philosophies are. Schedule a call. You will speak to me directly. We can help you strategically plan your growth at the rate that's perfect for you and reach the success milestones that you want to reach. We treat every business like it's its own. So groundbreakinggrowth.com. Until next week, guys, stay thirsty. 